Hallelujah. It's happening right before our eyes. The supernatural is here. And God is at work in our lives. You may be seated in high places. In Jesus' name, what a great and mighty God we serve. It's just a great honor to have this opportunity to worship God, to serve Him, and to join in fellowship with other people of like mind and like spirit. God has brought us so far as a church. The story of our church is a story of grace, is a story of divine favor. It is the story of God at work in our lives. It is the story of what God can do with a man. It is the story of God's goodness and sovereignty at work in our lives. And I trust that today as we remember this good God who has been good to us all these years, something unusual, something supernatural, something brand new, something fresh, will break forth upon our lives and take us to a new dimension in our lives as individuals, as a church, even as a nation, we are going into a new level. Somebody said amen to that. Amen. In the Bible, there are two examples of people whose stories probably can inspire us as a church and as individuals today. The first is a man called Caleb. Caleb was an old man who dared to take on new challenges. He was 85 years old. 40 years prior to his 85th birthday, he had received a promise from God that he would inherit a huge mountain, a property for his family. He waited for 45 years. Some success had come. Some things had been achieved. But on his 85th birthday, Caleb decided that his best days were ahead of him. So in Joshua chapter 14, verse 10 to 13, we read, And now behold, the Lord has kept me alive. As he said, these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses, while Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now here I am this day, 85 years old. As yet, I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war both for going out and for coming in. Now therefore, give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. For you heard in that day that the cities, how the Lord, how the Anakim were there and that the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. The Bible says, And Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as an inheritance. I pray that the spirit of Caleb will rest upon you. I pray that something will touch your life to this morning. Something supernatural, something unusual. You will keep going. You will keep going even to your 85th birthday, to your 90th birthday, to your 100th birthday. You will not retire. You will not sit back just spectating life. You will rise up and make a difference in your time and in your day. The Apostle Paul gives us another picture. The Apostle Paul was an accomplished apostle. But he dared to push for more. In Philippians chapter 3 verse 13 to 15, he says, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal this to you this is the mindset forgetting the things that lie behind let's press on today i've come to you icgc to tell you don't forget the god of the past don't forget the acts of god in the past don't forget the grace of god in the past but forget your past achievements forget what you have done but remember the god who was with you in the past because that same God of the past is going to do new things with us in the future. And the future will be greater than the present. I stand here today fully persuaded that we are about to enter great days. What should be the mindset for the future? 
How are we supposed to think? Paul says, let this mind be in you. What kind of mindset will help us to possess the future? There are three things I will touch on today and focus on one of them. The first is that if we're going to capture the future, we have to be committed to kingdom living. The second is that we have to be committed to generational thinking. The third is we have to be committed to global impact. To be committed to kingdom living is to make the kingdom of God our focus. The preaching of the gospel. The living of holy lives. The working in agreement. Committed to God who has given us life. Committed to Christ who died for us. Committed to the Holy Spirit who gives us strength and life. The kingdom life is a life of transformation. It's a life that will take you from the bottom and bring you to the top. It's a life that makes us good people. But I want to focus on the second thing that I believe we need to develop in order to harness the opportunities of the future. And that is generational thinking. Everybody say with me, generational thinking. If we are going to make a difference in the future, we have to be generational thinkers. I like an analogy that my good friend Bishop Tudor Bismarck used in describing the African situation and why we don't seem to be making progress. He says, it's like running a relay race. There are four people to complete the race. The first person starts with the baton and starts the first leg of the race. If that team that the person is part of must complete the course, the baton must be passed on successfully from one generation to the other, to the other, to the other. But in our parts of the world, it seems as if we don't pass on the baton. So one generation starts with the baton. It starts running and running and running and running very hard. But somewhere in the middle, it drops the baton and keeps running without the baton because the baton is what authorizes the next person to run. So you get to the next person you have run, but you didn't pass on the baton. So the next person starts his race. But in order to run his race, he has to go back and pick the baton that was dropped. And then start halfway of the previous generation's race in order to run his race. By the time he gets to start his race, the people he was on the line with have gone way ahead of him. He also runs somewhere and drops the baton. So the next generation has to come back and come back and probably come and pick the baton from the first generation, run the first generation's race, run the second generation's race before he runs his own race. By the time he starts to run his race, he's an old man. The fourth person starts, he has no baton. So he comes back. He runs the first generation's race, second generation's race, third generation's race. By the time he starts to run his own race, everybody who started with him has completed. The stadium is empty, but he's still running. That is our tragedy as Africa. That is why a person grows to be about 40 years before he buys his first car. A person lives to be about 65 years before he builds his first house. Sometimes 70 years before he lives in his own house. By the time he's ready to live in his own house, life has battered him so much he moves into his own house and dies. Why? Because he has been running a race that was not for him. He didn't start with strength. Those who are supposed to hand over the baton to him drop the baton so he has to run the past generation's race in order to win if we are going to move we have to make sure we become generational thinkers generational thinkers are people 
who run not for themselves alone, but run so that the next generation can run better. In our country, we had a generational thinker. A young man who left the shores of Ghana in the latter part of the 1800s. His name was Tete Kwashi. He traveled to a small place called Fernando Po in Equatorial Guinea now. He worked as a plantation farmer, almost a slave. He was not a middle-level worker. He was not a high-level worker. He was just a worker. But when he left Fernando Po, he brought with him a few cocoa pots. Incidentally, he came from Teshi. But he went to the mountains... The Abri Mountains went to Kropong, eventually settled in Mampong, planted his first seeds from the cocoa that he brought. He didn't have much success very early. By 1879, he planted the first seeds in Mampong. By 1891, that is between 1879 and 1891. That's about 12 years. Ghana exported its first cocoa. 12 years after the first man planted the first seed. We exported the first cocoa. Can you imagine how many bags we exported? Two bags. But by 1910... From 1879 to 1910, that is just about 31 years, is, is that right? 31 years. Ghana had become the leading producer of cocoa. Between 1910 and 1980, Ghana was the world's largest exporter of cocoa. The cocoa industry became the foundation of our economy. Currently, more than 40% of all our export earnings come from cocoa. It occupies about 10% of our gross national product. Why am I giving you all these statistics? Because one man, one man carried the economy of a country on his shoulders. A generational thinker is one who is able to sow seeds for the future. A generational thinker is not somebody who is only committed to what he wants to enjoy today, but somebody who says, if I run with this race, I must make sure the next generation does not run my race. The next generation must run its own race. I must empower the next generation. A generational thinker thinks beyond his personal needs. They sow seeds for the future. A generational thinker must plan at least for four generations ahead of him. If you read the Bible, every blessing of God, he says, is to the third and fourth generation. When God blesses you, it has generational consequences in the same way if he curses you. If we are going to take charge of the future, we have to be generational thinkers. That means that for everything you do, you have to think of the person who is coming after you. And make sure the person coming after you will not be worse off, but will be better than you are. In very, very little things that we do. And I feel that for us, one of the significant ways as a church that we can be generational thinkers is to educate the future. That is why beginning from this year, we are starting a new project, the Central Educational Trust. The first half of the project, we're going to plant first class, world class, senior secondary schools in every region of Ghana. We're going to take it to every district of Ghana. And if God help us, we'll take it to every community of Ghana. We don't want the children of Ghana to go to school and learn ignorance. 
We want the children of Ghana to go to school and learn to be empowered so that what we give to them will not make them come back, but will cause them to move. They have to be able to run their own race and compete with their generation and not fight a previous generation's battles. We must build capacity for the future. And we must power the next generation. A generational thinker, which is what I'm asking from you today, is a person who says, my life is not just about me. It's about the person coming after me. If you are a generational thinker and you even go to the restaurant to eat food and it's a buffet, you think about the person who is coming after you, not yourself alone. So you don't clear all the food on the buffet table simply because it's available to you. A generational thinker says, "By when I leave, the next person coming after me should not be empty. A generational thinker says, it's not just about me. I must make sure those coming after me have it easier than I had it. A generational thinker says, I want people to stand on my shoulders to go higher so that in their generation, they'll be greater than me and my generation. In little, little ways, when you are a generational thinker, when you have used something and you are giving it to somebody else to use, you give it to the person in a better shape than you found it. A generational thinker says, if you rent a house and you are leaving the house after your rent is over, you keep the house in a good condition and you paint it so that the next tenant does not have to come and repair your problems. A generational thinker says, if I go for a public gathering like this one and I drink water, I don't want to give a burden to the next group. I want to make sure I carry my own burden so the next generation does not start by carrying my burdens. A generational thinker is thinking about the next person on the line. I'm telling you, Africa, I'm telling you, my friends, if we want to make an impact, we have to stop just thinking about ourselves. We have to be generational. We have to invest into the future. And that is what this church is going to commit itself to. My call on you is to be generational thinkers. A generational thinker does not just plan for today. If you are a generational thinker, you buy land, not just for yourself, not even for your children, but for your children's children. I want the 200 years from now, or 100 years from now, when all of us are gone, the next generation of ICGC people to come here and praise us that we had foresight, that we thought of them. I want them to come to inherit thousands of acres of land that we bought for them. I want them to come and run schools that we built for them. I want them to come and attend hospitals that we built for them. That they will not come and say, our fathers ate and were satisfied and they rose up and just rejoiced. As God said concerning the Israelites, he says they ate, they drank, they rose up and they danced. And therefore God slew all of them. A selfish generation. After you are gone, will life be easier for those who are coming after you? If our generation, those who are ahead of us had planned better for us, life would have been easier for us. We would not be fighting some of the battles we are fighting today. By this time, it would have been possible for a Ghanaian to start life at 21 with his own car. It should have been easier for a Ghanaian to start marriage in a nice rented house, and within five years of marriage, buy his own house. But you and I know, but for most people, that is a dream that may never come to pass. And it's not because we don't have land and we don't have opportunity, it's because we don't have generational thinkers. Tell the person as you be a generational thinker. Think about those coming after you. In every area, 
I want my life to empower some of these young people here. They are older people, but a few young people here. Some of the people here are young. My children. I want my life to make it easier for you. So when you come in, you don't have to fight Otabel's battles. Otabel should have fought his own battle and given you opportunity so that you can fight your own battle by standing upon my success. Not standing upon my failure. Parents, be generational thinkers. Think of your children. Think of your children. Invest for their future. If you are a young family starting today, open an account for your children. Start saving for your children. Start investing for your children. Make sure when your children start, they have something to start life with. We must empower the next generation. That was the ministry of Jesus Christ. If you read Psalm 22, it starts with a phrase that some of you will recognize. Psalm 22 is a prophetic psalm or a messianic psalm. It says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? You know that Jesus repeated those words on the cross. But when you go to verse 14 and 15 of the same psalm, he says, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like was. I, it has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a pot shed. My tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. It is describing suffering of an individual who is Jesus. But then in verse 30 and verse 31, he tells us the benefits. He says, a posterity, a posterity shall serve him. It will be recounted of the Lord to the next generation. They will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born that he has done this. It says that the reason why he suffered is for posterity to come and benefit. For the next generation, for those who are yet to be born, to come and recognize that something was done for them. And in my mind's eye, I see a future of a church that is vitally impacting human life. I see the next 50 years, young people, graduates from our primary schools, from our secondary schools, from our universities. I see God allowing this church to demonstrate with other Christian churches and other believers the life that Jesus Christ talked about. That is not just something we experience in our hearts alone, but it's a life that can be lived here on earth. Because he taught us in the Lord's Prayer to pray, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, whatever God has in heaven, he wants us to have a foretaste of it here on earth. A generational thinker empowers the next generation to do more and achieve better. That is what I'm demanding from you. A generational thinker. When you leave here, you go to your homes, be a generational thinker. You go to your office, be a generational thinker. I believe the destiny of people does not depend on their government. It's good to have a government, but the destiny never depended on government. It's always depended on God and the people who are committed to live a better life. And I pray that in the next 25 years, you'll be alive to see the new ICGC. And when the story is told, you would also say, I was there on the 25th anniversary when we filled the Ohinjan Stadium. And Pastor Otabel said, we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And he talked about generational thinking. Then you can testify about how far we have come. The measuring line is not what the last 25 has achieved is what the next 25 is going to achieve.
celebrating 25 years of raising leaders, shaping vision, and influencing society through Christ. One of the important things that took place during our 25th anniversary celebration and Thanksgiving was the launch of the Central Educational Trust. This is a, a project that is at the heart of our church, at the heart of the leadership of the church. It's a project that we believe will bring about the transformation in society that we have always envisaged and lived for and prayed for. The Central Educational Trust is, is a, an initiative that is starting uh, beginning this year to construct uh, top level senior secondary schools all over the country. We're going to touch the regional capitals and then we're going to go below that and then we would have other levels of education at the junior high school level as well as the primary, the kindergarten level. But we, as you know, we started our Central University College which is doing well. So the next year is to go to the secondary level. And um, the first part of this project, uh, we were honored to have uh, my very dear friend and a, a, and a good uh, a person who is committed to this ministry, Osajifu uh, Amwetio for Penny in the Ochehine, uh, he donated land from his kingdom, uh, 155 acres of land free of charge, for us to build the first school in that area. And uh, we want to take this opportunity to thank him. And, and in appreciation for his donation, we asked him to come and launch the project for us. And he came and spoke some very profound words about his own initiatives uh, to build a university in Achime Buakwa and also to be able to influence society. Here is a man whose vision, I believe, ties in with the vision of our church, uh, bringing transformation through Christ to the society. So let's get into the service as we observe the launch of this great project and we trust that maybe you or your children or your children's children will one day be a product of a school set up by the Central Educational Trust. Celebrating 25 years of raising leaders, shaping vision and influencing society through Christ. I am just delighted to be here today and to witness a success story. I just saw Professor Stephen Adai just behind me, and I remembered one time in one of his lectures, he said, leadership is cause, and everything else is effect. The leadership that we have at ICGC just represent that statement. 25 years ago, my friend, Dr. Otebo, calls you and the church that 25 years later, there will be a central university that will support Osu Children's Home they will provide clean water for low-income and underprivileged children. That he will do so many things for us here in Ghana and you. He has said it all. The significance of all of us is not the office we hold. It's not the titles we carry. It's certainly not about the degrees we have, the money we have. It is about how we have made other people better. The life of the greatest man in divinity is all about that, service, and to make other people's lives better. And the Central Educational Trust will be well supported because of his leadership. But as even it starts now, there will be enemies, there will be naysayers, there will be those who will say that, well, he can't do it. As it were told in 25 years ago. But in this church, I learned that when you're confronted with challenges, you just look up and say, let your will be done, Lord. Right here in this church, he taught me that you need to have a purpose in life. And while people may say that you can't, just push forward and you get there. 
And so at this moment, I will declare on this beautiful day that the Central Education Trust is duly launched. Thank you so much, and God bless you. Celebrating 25 years of raising leaders, shaping vision, and influencing society through Christ. Well, I trust that you've enjoyed this stay with us for this one hour. You've listened to the testimonies, you've listened to the music, you've listened to the message, and you, I hope that something in your heart tells you that God's grace is also towards you. The reason we bring this to you is just to make you aware that we serve a faithful God, a good God. That when we start little, we don't have to despise our small beginnings, that we can trust God for great things with our lives. And it's not just great things for ourselves, that we can make a difference in other people's lives. And I trust that that has been the message that has been communicated to you, that you can also make a difference, that you can touch somebody's life, that God can use you just as you are. And I believe that the way God uses us is when we commit our lives into his hands and when we open our hearts to him. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior, there is no success without Christ as the center of your life. And I want to encourage you today to make a bold step to take Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. I'm going to just pray a simple prayer with you for Christ to come into your life. And if you really want to begin a journey with Christ, just say with me, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know you died for me. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Come into my life, change my life, and make me a new person. I thank you for accepting me today. Amen. If you truly pray that prayer with your heart in sincerity, I believe God heard you, and I believe that there is new life in your life today. And I want you to write to me either by email or or by the normal mail or, or, or make a call to us and we will send you a booklet on how to live the Christian life and how to be assured that you're truly a child of God. I believe that this journey with Christ is what makes all the difference in our lives. Well, if you've enjoyed this story of the first 25 years of ICGC, stay around for the next 25 years because you'll be around to hear the part two of this story. 25 years from today. In the meantime, I'm Pastor Mesa Otabil. Shalom, peace, and life to you. Thank you for making time to watch Living Word. 